Yeah, so my sporting earliest memory would be, you know, growing up in South London on a kind of play football, you know, on a multi-use game area. It wasn't actually, that wasn't the name. It was just a pitch on the estate. Yeah, um, was you call it the, the pen or the, or the cage or whatever? Yeah, the pen or wherever it is to call the den, pen, whatever it was. Um, and I think what we did, you know, run out and every played sports. And um, one of the sports that was kind of the one that everyone played was football. You know, football was, and you played other stuff like cannon and all these other things that people made up along the way. But football was the one. And, you know, you did it, you came out, you know, Saturday, you run downstairs from a third, fourth, fourth floor block and you play football. You know, football was, you know, it doesn't matter how bad the football was. You know, we played with that 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 broken, ripped up football. So yeah, that was my early kind of experience with sports, and I think you know it, it brought you know, as as sports do, it created good relationships and friendship groups. From coordinate sport, it's the drive phase, a show about sports founders, leaders, and experts, and the stories behind their business journeys. Our guest this episode is Oleyo Rahman, co CEO of Active Communities Network. Oli is a pioneer in the world of youth and community development. During our conversation, he opens up about his background and how that has shaped his outlook and approach. We hear the story behind the creation of ACN and their practice to increase impact through partnership and networking. A great episode with insightful takeaways for anyone working in grassroots development. Enjoy the show. Okay, excited to welcome Oli Rachman with us today. He is the co-founder of Active Communities Network and joint CEO, one of our previous guests, Jim Donnelly. Um, the charity works across all boroughs in, in London, and we're going to hear about the founding and the launch. So really excited to welcome you onto the show today, Oli. Thank you, James. Yeah, no, I appreciate this. Yeah. Always do, just kind of the background gets to know you a little bit better. And I think your story um, out of most is, is really interesting. So, I mean, if we go back, I normally try and pitch it around sport. So what would be your, if you had to think back, what would be your earliest sporting memory that you've got? Yeah, so my sporting earliest memory would be, you know, growing up in South London on a kind of play football you no, know, on a multi-use game area, which wasn't actually that wasn't the name. It was just a pitch on the estate. Yeah, um, it was a concrete the, the pit. pen or the, or the cage or whatever. Yeah, the pen or wherever it is to call the den, pen, whatever it was. Um, and I think what we did, you know, run out and every play sports, and um, one of the sports that was kind of the one that everyone played was football. You know, football was, and you played other stuff like cannon and all these other things that people made up along the way. But football was the one, and you know, you did it, you came out. You know, Saturday, you run downstairs from a third, fourth, fourth floor block and you play football. You know, football was, you know, it doesn't matter how bad the football was. You know, we played with that 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 broken, ripped up football. So, yeah, that was my early kind of experience with sports. And I think, you know, it, it brought, you know, as, as sports do, it created good relationships and friendship groups. And it was really that kind of informal environment, right? So that's the first thing, just in the estate with your friends. Um, what about what about school and school sport? How was that for you? School in general yeah, so- and sport in school? I don't know, I'll, t- I'll tell you a little bit about where I grew up, so then you kind of get a little bit of understanding how we kind of done sports. So when I grew up on an estate where, you know, where it was dominantly a white community, you know, it was a minority group that was growing up, you know, we tried to play sports in our own little groups, in our own crowds. Um, you know, there was a lot of racism at the time. So, you know, you played with the people that you felt comfortable with or, or you got chased off the pitch for, you know, for whatever they looked at us, whatever colour we was. So, you know, sports was, even that was a fight to play on the pen because, you know, you got kicked out because a lot of the time, People are hanging around in those areas. So just so, just to frame that up, this is this is South East London. What years are we, look, are we talking so about? So yeah, so this is in the eighties. So when I, I was born in the seventies, and this is in the eighties when you know Rockingham Estates, Elephant and Castle. You know, this is when my younger years, you know, was playing kind of that. You know, as whoever knows Rockingham Estate in SC One, it was kind of very much so. You know, loads of old school kind of estate blocks. They weren't the high rises. They were like the full floors. You know, them brown brick blocks. Yeah. They had like an insular kind of way where all the pitches were in the middle. So you know, everything was insular. And yeah, so that was kind of where we kind of played football most of the time. And, and you know, football was amazing then because, you know, that was, there was no social media. There was no, like, internet. There was no, you know, that was your gathering point. That was the point that, you know, you met your friends. You know, relationships grew really strong then. And, you know, you had to man up to being not picked last. You know, you know, when you stand up and you get picked. You know. So that was really where sports kind of felt to me around teamwork, relationship building, understanding relationships as a young man growing up, you know, in that environment. And, you know, you pick up, that oh god you know I'm not that great at football but I'm gonna still give it a go you know you lose confidence but you, you sometimes build confidence because you, you know people push you to play so yeah that was the early days of kind of really playing sports and I, I guess what, the demographic there sorry to cut you in there the demographic on that on the estate you said there was a lot of like, conflict racism etc is that the different communities and stuff come together or is that just like a predominantly white estate and you were in there or was... yeah so Elephant and Castle was a very different you no know, uh, kind of estate you know growing in Rockingham you no know, there's mainly dominantly Bangladeshis Afro Caribbean and 
Africans that were growing up on that estate. And, you know, one of the things you faced was, you know, the, the racism of, you know, calling all the names, you know, coming on the estate, chasing you off. Like you had the packy bashing, you had, you know, all, all the stuff that was going on. And, you know, they used to cut their people, like, you know, again, I won't name no names, but, you know, people used to come in, you know, from especially the white community, you know, they used to say, you know, they used to just chase you off. Like sometimes you used to think, what, what was happening here? You know, as a young lad, you don't really know, but you kind of work out that they don't like you. So, you know, you run off. So, yeah, so that kind of whole thing around sports, because, you know, for me was that sometimes you felt, not wanted that you shouldn't be playing sports. So that's why, you know, you follow football teams that are not close to you. You follow them far and beyond. You know, Liverpool was doing great. Everyone was following Liverpool in the 80s. You know, and then, you know, there was you no know, when you first saw the first black player, you know, you felt, wow, you felt part of it. So I think that all that kind of mixed feelings and kind of mixed thinking kind of really, you know, made us as a community, you know, you know, sport was the main entertainment after watching TV on a Saturday night. You know, if you haven't watched Snooker, you know, you watch football, you know, it was those kind of wrestling, you know, all those kind of sports that it didn't have a language because it just, people watched it because they had a rule. And, you know, that's what I kind of took the ethos away. So, yeah, that was my early days. And, you know, growing up, I always loved the fact that, you know, sports brought people together. Were you a sporty family? I know you haven't really spoken about it. About no, we were a, we a sporty family, you know, we all gave it a go. We didn't really kind of, you know, because, you know, sport was more watched than played. In so my what, family. What would you say, that I'm probably going to get onto it later on in terms of the work you do at the moment and that family unit. What was the focus like in your family growing up like in terms of from your parents? Was it was it an academic focus? Was it a bit about your background? Yeah, so let's, no, listen, coming from an ethnic minority background, I'm Bangladeshi, so coming from that community, you know, education was important. You know, you had to do education. And myself being the youngest out of the you know, five brothers and sisters, I was a bit of a rebel and I got caught up in... Like as you do in those kind of youth culture, music scene, going out, hanging around the staircase, you know, smoking, doing all the things that my parents didn't want me to do. So when I had that, you know, I was living two lives. I had another face on, I had another face going back home. And, you know, you, you kind of took that on and off as you come in at the house. So my family was really kind of that hardworking, law-abiding community, but faced all the racism issues that, you know, kind of sometimes traumatised my family. So, like, when I was 17, my house got petrol bombed on the estate. You know, they tried, you know, it was all these like slogans. Again, you know, it was kind of offensive. It made my parents and my dad and you know, my older siblings feel very worried about living around the area. And we got moved out of the area, we got moved to Peckham. So all with all of that, I think my family background was, you know, making sure that we all had a good life, you know, work hard. You know, you're, we're kind of like the third generation, trying to you know, get to uni, get, you know, try and get that degree. You know, is it meaningful? Maybe to more to my family was to, than it was to me. But as I grew up, I understand it's meaningful now because it's helped me. Went on to do a higher education after that, you know, got my kind of higher diploma in systemic management. You know, so it's helped me think you know, as a foundation of thinking, which allows me to translate to the work that I do today. Because I think, you know, your environment and your journey, especially where growing up and in the communities, and this is where active communities kind of really fitted, is, is that you use your life skills and your experiences and, and, you know, you learn from you know, educational talk stuff, which you combined it and you try to, you know, create a business model in your head, how you're going to operate running, you know, be active communities network or wherever you work. So I think with that characteristics that I built up with you know, my peers around me, because I'm a bit, like I can think, I can think streetwise, but my family say, why are you thinking streetwise? You should be thinking, it's having that balance of for myself and knowing who I am growing up in a community, in an environment, in a fast, rapid moving, you know, cultural sports environment as well, which helps, um, you know, me think slightly differently out of the box. Yeah, because you say that in terms of like that informal community setting, what were you like in formal settings then? So going through school, college, etc. Were you able to engage with that or was it something that turned you off, you know, as you come through? Yeah, so I, went, I was lucky. I went to a school that gave me the opportunity. I went to London Nautical School down in Waterloo. Yeah, it was like a kind of Royal Navy kind of after the, uh, the Titanic's kind of sank. There's this school was built around the Royal Navy. So they were very sport straight rugby, football. You know, sailing was a really good one. Was that swimming. A single sex? Was that just boys? Yeah, yeah single yeah, yeah. sex. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a boys' school. Yeah, so, so yeah, we had. School. Yeah, so we had the opportunity to continue doing that. We done like kind of cross country running. So we done different sports, and like, that's where I carried a lot of that thinking. You know what? It shaped who I am growing up, and I think it helped me realize and and build more team. You know, building, working together with my friends in school because a lot of stuff you had to do seamanship. It was called. You had to do a lot of teamwork. So that helped me kind of establish that teamwork is really important. And kind of not just in football, because you play as a team, but, you know, when you're trying to sail a boat, if one of you pulled the wrong rope, you're all falling in. <laughs> and no one wants to fall into the cold river Thames. And so, yes, I think the school helped me. That journey helped me, you know, solidify that sport is important. And I think you know, if you ask me that sport's not the be and end of who I am, you know, because I, I love music, you know, music really kind of operated me in a different way. 
but yeah, sport has definitely helped me think about how you know we would use active communities as a tool. Uh, to kind of really embed it into our organisation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, just hearing, you know, it sounds like there's a, almost like a really well-rounded childhood to some extent, like you've got loads of different influences. It's not like just one influence that young people today might have. It might not be a negative one all around them. You, schools are different, like sounds like quite a disciplined set up at school. Obviously parents, you've got your friends in the community, et cetera, and, and, and different interests, music, sport, et cetera. So was, did that all kind of come together? I know obviously when you finished school, university, et cetera, you went on to work for, was it so that council straight away from uni or what did you finish your university degrees you got a couple of degrees haven't you? yeah I've got my degree in business management and then I've done systemic management as a higher diploma so yeah so my journey kind of just to kind of add I suppose you know the environment I grew up a lot of my friends were not the best of characters and then I, I don't want to shout their names out or anything but like you know growing up in South East London it was hard it was deep it was dark you know you had some of the issues of inequality deprivation all those words that are describing South East London. And that helped me, again, come out my doorstep and look at friends that were struggling. You know, so, you know, you talk about I was, being, I was rounded. Yes, I was, but I wasn't rounding the way that when I went out, my peers were not rounded. They had all the issues that you see, social issues that young people are facing today. But maybe in a way that some of them have learned later on in life to change. Some are, can't change because they're so caught up in issues that, you know, affects them. That vicious cycle, some of my friends fall into that vicious cycle, having kids and getting into that vicious cycle. As where some of us navigated the way through. Like a lot of our peers went into drug dealing, went into, you know, getting into all sorts of problems because they're trying to survive. I think what happened was that sport always helped because it doesn't matter what you was doing. If you were playing football, you know, you came with your trainers, you played, it doesn't matter what you was drug dealing or going to university or, you know, you was into criminal activity. So that kind of, I saw more than I was involved in it, you know, because one of the things that helped me, I suppose, where I have that relationship with young people and organisation that we're trying to do today, and they slightly different from Jim, is that I wasn't involved deeply as some of these guys were around me and the community around me, but I was born in that community. I faced it and I saw it every day outside. So early 17, I realised I'd done my first kind of youth work course at uh, Goldsmith University, uh, stage uh, level one. Uh, induction to youth work and I thought I like this and um, you know at the same time you're, you're following the music scene and you know as you know it was kind of the drum and bass scene was growing rapidly at the time I uh, say so you, you work for getting out you work for doing buying the best clothes you know at the same time you're hustling away through the streets to find, but it, sports always was there football was always there it was one of the things that any pen you saw I thought playing football with it was goalie to goalie that was happening so yeah and then when I, when I was on my journey doing that I've done a bit. Then I went to play works. So I went to the younger ones, and, and then I could, by that time, as I said, no, got into moved on Rockingham Estate, moved to North Peckham Estate at sixteen, and then no, again saw the same things in a different. So what, what was that like? Obviously moving, and obviously it was it was tough on the Rockingham Estate. Moving to a whole new area, or Peckham. What was that like? Was that a bit of a shock at sixteen, or did you want to go? How was it when you when you arrived then? My mum was around. like, we're not going North Peckham. She was like, no, I heard about it. But the thing was, I was lucky because some of my peers from schools were from North Peckham, knew people from there. So when so we was right outside, yeah, so we was like moved right outside the Dambelo, which is now the Dambelo the Taylor Centre now, literally on that block. And you know what? People label North Peckham as this, this crazy place. Yes, it may have like any estate up and down the country has its mad times. I think the community feeling was great. You know, I didn't feel any more, I didn't feel so much love, you know, that you could have expected that age from a community because everybody was an auntie and uncle, Uncle Wilfred. You know, you had all these kind of people that are Caribbean dominantly and the Vietnamese community. You know, there was one or two Asian families and there was the old, you know, the white families out from the old North Peckham estate. So yeah, you had, but it was all, it was all unity. It felt nice, you know, everyone was good morning. It was hello. You know, it was all that, the news portrayed negativity but it didn't talk about how many people say good morning to their neighbours now it doesn't happen right well that's one of my questions I was going to say now like what is how things change I mean a lot we're going to talk about a lot of things but in terms of just that one aspect if you're looking now 20 years 15 20 years later how does that relate back to what it was like then yeah to- I think times have changed James you know it's become that the young people have a different outlook you know and I'm not that older like to say you know it's rapidly changed but there's something that's happened where the young people are always angry why are they angry? I don't know if it's, you know, they're going for a movement or it looks good or it feels that's how they need to be to present themselves on the streets, on the road. So I, I couldn't exactly tell you, but I know there is a... There you think is that's a, like maybe inequality and stuff like that? Do you think that gap's yeah, getting so bigger gonna, and yeah, bigger? Yeah, I think that sometimes they feel they're left out. You know, they don't trust people. And this is where, you know, again, we talk about community, how it came. It was that trust relationship. That relationship is so important, you know, all the way from a young person. And I think a lot of young people now, again, are faced with more different complex challenges than when we grew up it was simple there was no social media there was no internet there was no cursing over the evening at nine o'clock because you could do it over social media you either did it out on the road and if you was at home you was at home 
right? You didn't really have a phone. You didn't really have all the... You, know, you had a bit of a text messaging situation going on, what it is now. So I think it's more complex. You know, you can be quite insular and you can be at home and you can be like a keyboard warrior, right? You can be this kind of person that you, maybe you're not. The same things like I said to you earlier on, you know, going out home, coming out of the house, you know, being somebody and going back home and being somebody else. So young people can do that in their bedroom, right? It's easy to do that. You can create them. So I think it's more complex. I think there's something around that there's a supply and demand situation trying to help a lot of young people because the youth population is growing rapidly in some of these boroughs. You know, there's been cutbacks. There's been no, again, sports is not, it's there. But, you know, young people don't want to play on the concrete pitches anymore. They want to play on AstroTurf. They get on the 3G. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not. Now, apparently, all the ankles and that starts going wobbly. So you get all of that, you know, Then and I think that's what's happened. And I think they're wired up differently because they're told things differently. You know, they're expecting things differently. As where we grew up, we didn't know. We just got out and we did with the basics. They fight four channels, a football, concrete pitch. You did it. You enjoyed it. As where now, there's more than that. So just looking back then, I know obviously you were working at Southwark Council. Is that in the youth service? I know you play work. Did you move into youth service before? Just in yeah, the lead so up to, I, to how we got into, how you launched that to communities. But what was it like? Yeah, just so we've done play when I've really kind of done more of that play work to kind of introduce myself because I was a young person to how do I work with young people and it was kind of, you no, know, they were kind of six to 11 year olds. And then we've done again, you know, it's for, it was easier way for me to learn on the route because I think one of the things was, you know, working with my peers at that time they weren't going to listen to me. You know, 17-year-old little towards the same time, it's like, you're not, it's not happening. But we had lots of good youth workers around, so they were mentoring us up and down in, in Summit Council. And then I was offered a volunteering post and then done some work there again. You know, went back and done a bit of outreach. And this from volunteering led to some paid work. You know, learned a lot because you can't learn from the paper. You have to learn from those individual and those scenarios that you're putting. So I think that was important. I think, you know, a paper will tell you something, but when you're there, how do you deal with certain situations? So I think I learned a lot of that. Um, it built my character. It built me to understand more about different um, communities and diversity and family issues. You know, sometimes you make assumptions, which is always wrong. So, yeah, I think it shaped me up to where, you know, I started thinking, you know, this is where I need to be. Even though I was doing a business management degree, because I went back, I went to uni late, about 22. And while I was at college, I was doing art and design. So I was doing lots of that art and design, digital design, early digital design. And yeah, so I, I was kind of confused to, how, you know, where do I want to be? But every time I knew I was doing play work, you felt like I was enjoying it. And I got out and I thought I was giving something back. It felt rewarding. Um, so I continued that journey. Because what I was seeing outside my doorstep, it was, again, North Peckham Estate. You know, you step out there, someone's getting mugged, someone's getting stabbed, you know, this antisocial behaviour, police chasing up and that. So I thought, you know, I can help because I can relate to young people. I had a skill that, so I discovered that. Yeah, do you know, that's really interesting. Something I hear a lot is, on the one hand, describe the community as like a welcoming, safe, friendly place. But then the other side, you can go out the doorstep and all these kind of violent acts happening. It's a strange situation to be in, right? If you, like, you're in that environment, but... Because you're in it, you f- you feel safe because of the community. But then people look from the outside; that's all they're going to see, right? All the negativity. Yeah, it's a bit tribalism, about. isn't it? It's like yeah. tribalism. You know, you have your own issues with your different tribes, right? But when you're in the tribe, it's safe. So it felt like that in North Peckham. You know, you went there. There was a lot of love from the older community. People looked after each other. But there was also darkness falls. If you're not from the area, you know they know because them big blocks they could see you. They like, they used to call it liquor tech. You know, tech. You know, this to rob you. So all that thing, the bus drivers, you know, they, used to, they again carry money. The bus driver don't carry money now, but they used to try and take you know, the money off the bus driver, the postman, try and take people's gyros and that. So you had all those things that was inequality, deprivation, that people trying to survive. And it wasn't because of out of choice, because no one wants to go out and rob someone. No one wants to go out and no child wants to grow up to do this. So children have seen their parents in deprived situation. Children grew up very quickly. Then we had the Damilola incident. You know, we had the two young lads that you know got caught up in it. So there's a whole generation. The age was getting younger and younger because it became a point of where there was another way to survive if you wanted those trainers. There was another way to survive if you wanted those. And this, I'm talking about that time then. Now it's different. Now you've got people on iPhones and iPods and all sorts. But it was that. It was the trainers. It was the jacket, the Averitch jacket. It was all those things that people wanted. And, you know, the chippy shirt, the Moschino T-shirt, the ice. And they were finding ways. And that was, that's what it was. Because if you talk about it now, it's very different. They don't want that. They're not after your Moschino T-shirt or your Air Max ones. Or So I think it's... Yeah, it is. It's confusing to the outside world. But and for us living in those communities, it made sense. It made sense. So you're at Southern, you're doing the play work. You've worked, how long were you there for? And this is like, was this the mid-90s? Is that the type of time? Yeah, so mid-90s, I know, like kind of when I left school, I volunteered all the way through to the mid-90s, to the noughties, done youth work. And then I started, then I kind of finished my degree. And then I ended up working in Tower Hamlets um, in mainly the dominantly Bangladeshi community. You know, again, down in Limehouse, Poplar. And that time, you know, I was going for another scene. The grime scene was coming through hard. 
Now, down in Devon's Road, um, we all seen, like, you know, you have to do youth work and you have to work in a different way. Sports was there for two minutes. But, you know, music was huge then, you know, because kids suddenly found out that they can make music on a PC. They were rapping. And I remember, like, meeting some of the early grime artists, you know, down Devon's Road. We was doing sessions out of this porter cabin. Like, you know, it, was, it wasn't even a porter cabin. It was one of them, you know, where you store, like, all this stuff in it. It was kind of like a container. Oh, container, yeah. Um, yeah, we had, like, a, a deck session at the back. Yeah, you know, grime scene, it was just still playing you know, the Eskimo beat and it was a very different youth work. And then you had, again, you know, understanding very huge Bangladeshi community, huge white community and a very big, you know, Caribbean community. It was trying to battle it out, find their own. It was very complex. Devon Road was very different from Stepney Green to Poplar. So I understood another kind of dynamic. But what I realised, you know, I was told you can't go into Ocean Estate because it's dominantly white. I said, why can't you do that? Because if I talk to those guys, they, they will like me, you know. So I use my youth foot skills and I broke that stereotypical down. And I think you learn because London is, is strange. You, know, you can go from one borough, you can go to another borough and it's a whole different community and a whole different way of working. And that's what I learned. And I think by young people, it's how you engage them correctly yeah. to make sure that they look at you first before your colour and who you are. And if you can engage with them, they will engage with you. And that, I want to touch on um, in terms of how you how you operate across all the different boroughs. But first, what was the genesis of Active Communities Networks? I know you one of the founders. Can you just talk us through where that came about, where the idea initially came about, and how you went about getting it off the ground? Yeah, so I was working at a project in in Southwark at the time. Um, this was about two thousand and four, five kind of when it was feeling a little bit the current the agenda was changing. You know, the government really un- weren't understanding what youth work was. You know, you know, there was a recession coming and it hit hard. And I think, you know, last thing our government mind was youth work, right? And the work that we do. But what I also learned is that, you know, it was, you know, there was this kind of new language coming from, you know, the government around labelling young people. And, you know, for me, if you label a young person, you're not building no relationship with them. They start feeling the, the opposite of what you're trying to do. So I think, you know, when all that was happening, there's a group of us and there's quite a lot of in the community that are feeling, you know what, the same feeling, but no one knew what to do. So, you know, we got up, you know, left our jobs, you know, and set this up. And it, it was set up in, in the notion of that we believe in that what we do, we can create a methodology of thinking and, and what the methodology we've got now and, and that methodology grew out organically. But well, we knew what we did have, individual experiences that can help some young people in the community that are really struggling through the recession that's coming. And what we knew is that one football, again, goes back to my experience, a football on a pitch on the Ellsbury Estate, on the Rockingham Estate, on the Haygate Estate, drew young people to it. And it had no language, it had no barriers, it was just a rule to play football. And we did that and we suddenly felt that, you know what, this is where it starts from. That relationship is there by being in the community, physically being there and creating a presence of celebrating all the communities. And we did that really well because there was not just me, there was others, there was volunteers from different communities because we had a South American community that was growing rapidly as well. There's mainly Colombians. And then I think you know, we wanted to make sure we incorporate everybody. It was in the, on the Ellsbury State where we did most of our work. There was like 68 languages spoken, right? On top of that, there was gangs that were growing out of these new thinking and ways of doing things. You know, the music was growing even bigger. You know, it's becoming part of the sport element. Like people suddenly coming and walking up to the session with headphones on. You never saw that before, right? And everything, people start spitting on, you know, or rapping on the edge of the pitch. So it all started coming. But what we felt, we felt that we had that relationship. We understood. And those two things go together, like music and sport. Like you said, all footballers want to be musicians. Musicians want to be footballers. It kind of goes back and forth. What was the team like initially when you first started? Obviously, you've launched Active Punities Network. What was kind of the leadership team like at that point? I know Jim came in afterwards with the Belfast um, Yeah, so project the way session. we operate, so, you know, we had to make sure that, you know, we have a, a business model at the same time starting up. You know, when you start an organisation, you, you know, you're all hands-on. There's myself, there's a few others that came in as a leadership team. You know, there's two or three of us that found the organisation. And what we had, a mixture of ethnic, you know, makeup. You know, we had male and female. You know, we had an understanding of the community and that helped. But at the same time, I suppose we also had to not just deliver, we had to build this organisation. We had to think, you know, about mixed economy. Where is the next funding block going to come? How do we influence the local authority, the local funders? We was lucky. We had that knowledge base. And we had people in the team that had that knowledge base. And what helped was that, you know, we brought some funding over from where we left. Some of it followed us because they bought into me and others and you know, people because it is about people they buy into. It wasn't the organisation because the organisation was just a mere group of people that they saw. It was called London Active Communities at the time. And um, within a year or two, we worked out that, you know, we have to work extra hard, 12 hours a day, most probably, you know, you deliver all day. We had a laptop and a rat sack, you know, and we've, at that time, you know, you wasn't a wireless, you had to try and hop on to someone's desk that you knew as a partner, 
can I plug the Ethernet wire in to just download my emails? Because it was all changing at that time. Remember, there was no iPhones, there was no social media. In 2006, seven is when we kind of really launched the hard year of you know when active communities grew. And it was all those things that rack sack in the bag. You're delivering during the day. You got to run back to the office or whatever office that we had. Or we sometimes it's in the park sitting, trying to, we had, we sussed that you could get these little wire, wireless um, oh, internet dong- things. Dongles. Yeah, yeah. But they were quite big dongles at the time. And yeah, we was trying to, you know, do the monitoring, do the reports. Then you go home. Before you get home, you got to get up in the morning because you've got a session or you've got to plan it. And the volunteers were growing, people were buying into what we're doing. So it was hard because you had to, like with anything you start new, you have to put it all in. And yeah. in our situation, you have to deliver, and right? And you've got to make sure all the other mechanisms of funders and meetings is in there at the same time. So, yeah, it was hard. But, you know, because we loved our work, it worked. What was it like? So a lot of people, if you're working for the councils, generally a secure job. What was that like taking that leap from saying, well, I'm going to quit my job with my uh, other colleagues and start up um, something new? Was that Literally a big when... decision to make? And obviously, I don't know if you, like the time of your family, like that, you have to go back and explain that to Yeah, you. listen, we were, some, a lot of us were lucky. We were still, we were still at home with our, par- with, our, with our parents. It was the leap of change. We said, we're going to give it a go for a couple of years. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I think one of the things that we was lucky that as we moved into it, some of the funding was really secure because we thought about it as we're going in. So I was volunteering, getting into the situation, going to this post. You know, needed a lot of lot of work because you needed to build up your, you know, to build up some of the salaries, the volunteering costs, you know, all that, you know, the insurance. So you had to work around the clock and you need to influence. But luckily, the funders at that time were very had the innovation thinking behind they want to try something new because as the recession hit, there was lo- less money coming in. But at the same time, if we get innovation right at that beginning part, it may be sustainable. It's clear that it's a winning model and essentially you're getting, it wouldn't be standing the test of time if you weren't making that impact and be able to feed back to the funders and, and deliver on your promises. But at the start, when you were, obviously got to secure some funding, who was that with then? Is it And obviously nowadays, well, with the organisation, are you totally funded externally or how's it in terms of fundraising? Do you, yeah. do you raise it yourself? We go for big pots of money or sponsors, yeah. how's that work? So I think, you know, we early days had some spots of, there was little pots of money from the uh, Neighbourhood Renewal Fund, which was an NDC a pot that well, came through when we tried to say we were setting this up and then this, so that helped. And then we had the kind of the small pots of money from the London Network Partnership and that helped us kind of start up. And then, you know, we had to think very quickly around mix economy. They so we wrote applications, they went off to, you know, the Football Foundation at the time was investing quite a lot into football and um, the community. So that helped. The Football Foundation helped to kind of get us some bids in and then we've done some stuff with the Mayor's Office. But at the same time, there was the Laureus Sports for Good Foundation that came on and you know, they saw what we do. They liked what we did. You know, it was in the community. It was new. It was in innovation. You know, it was kind of working in a different way. And it was coming away from, you know, before we started our organisation, it was all about inclusion, inclusion. This was about, you know, celebrating what's in the community. So, yeah, we put some, you know, I remember our first project was like United Free Sports. How do you unite all the communities with six state languages of the Ellsbury State? Now, surely you've got to unite them before you can do the work. So we celebrated some of their kind of cultural understandings and trying to make sense of, you know, how do we get this right without excluding anybody? So the funders bought into that and I think bought into our model. Our methodology wasn't there yet. We didn't have no methodology. We had it in our head, but we felt, you know, we need to get it down on paper. The team grew quite quickly because the investment came. You know, we went into other boroughs and we started working with partners that allowed us to establish that, you know, maybe we are growing too quickly. So, you know, then we shrunk again yeah, a few years later. But what we did learn in that first early part is that you do need mixed economy. We didn't go to a local authority because we knew they had no money. Um, it was like, you know, if you go to them, what are you going to try and get them? Because we knew there's a recession coming and it came during our, and, and that was a difficult time to set up. But I think what we did learn with is relationship. Relationship is so important in, in, in an organisation like this. Because they trust the person, not just the organisation. The organisation is made up of people. And those people is who they refer to when you think of an organisation. Um, and that's just the, the mental thinking, right? You know, you think about the person. So I think, you know, we had that with the counsellors, the local sport development team. We sat around a lot of meetings. And what we did suddenly realise, we're a network. You know, we're not just active communities, London active communities. We're a group of smaller groups of people that are working with us. So we started working in Brent with Connect Stars. Now, we started working bits, doing bits in Tower Hamlets. We've done some stuff up in Crystal Palace, um, with Crystal Palace Football Club. We've done bits in Lewisham. And again, you know, when we say wider London, it's a network group of partners that knew us. We worked with them. Now, we've done similarities. So, yeah, it, it was a journey of hit and miss, but we had not just hit and miss, we had a plan. And if we did miss it, we had plan B to go to, to look at how do we create another way of working. And that's where the training centre came. You know, we started thinking that, you know, a lot of young people needed a bit of guidance and some sort of you know, unemployment was high. So we've done a lot of stuff around using some funding that came in through around how do we create a training centre fit for purpose to get young people into the market, job market. 
I guess that's the thing. Once you're connected and once you're in the network and I guess trusted by the young people, then you can use that as a way to intervene on various different levels, right? So you've got obviously training and, and education, etc. How does the organisation look now? So if we fast forward today, um, obviously going through massive challenges in pandemic uh, the moment, but in terms of the programmes we're delivering and the scope of it, um, just on the, like from your point of view in terms of London, what does it look like at the moment? Yeah, so, you know, if you talk about, actually, I can, you know, if you talk about London, any of the areas, but you know, I can talk about London, you know, the challenges are, you know, we this unexpected pandemic that came along, it's actually this time last year, right? You know, we was sitting in the office hearing this news kind of uh, around going around, there's something called a COVID-19. Had no clue. No, this time last year, we were just working it all out. Now, and I remember on the 23rd of March, we was told all oh, everything's going to be locked down. Now, these new laws are coming in. So it was challenging. You took it in quickly and you thought, hold on, as an organisation, we've just gone through a transition as well. You know, we've got you know, a new setup myself, Jim taking the leadership roles. Um, we've got a bit of an understanding of what we do going forward in this pandemic. You know, we had a new, we've got a new finance team. You know, we had a whole new restructure of the board as well. But one thing we did, we, we took a deep breath. We said, you know what, we're going to take four weeks and think it through. So we shut everything down as the government guideline came out. We moved some stuff onto online, which was, again, because of the our team was quite innovative. Now, they said, you know what, if it's online, you can be a mentor stand, you can do an online course, a boxing course. And so we started doing all those kind of stuff. So we experimented that early three months because we didn't know what was right or wrong because no one's ever done it in this way. You suddenly told that you can't do an activity. So we learned a lot. But on that journey, we also learned new things about social issues, about young people and family. And we knew that the internet, it's okay when we're in the office because we've got a good connection. Now, we suddenly saw that, Everyone can't jump on because they live in a flat on the 10th floor and they've got a little front room and they've got an internet connection and it's not working and they're all trying to do these exercises. We knew that they can't go to the park. So we started working out, wow, this is quite deep rooted, the challenges of you know digital issues, which now is digital poverty, um, what we recognise it as. And I think that was much so of a learning curve in the pandemic. So you, know, you had obviously people going through not just mental health. Mental health was one part of it. No one was really looking at our community is like, you know, you gave out food vouchers, but they're saying, look, we have this issue around, you know, we can't connect the kids up to do certain things because they'll either tethering off a phone. And that was the issue. So we learned that quite quickly. Yeah. I mean, looking at the future now coming out of this, hopefully, we've got some good news recently in terms of coming out of the pandemic and, and moving forward. What do you feel like the biggest challenges are going to be for the young people in communities? I think there's trauma. I think there's lots of trauma with young people. You know, a lot of young people have been, this year has been a huge journey. You just think what's happening in one year. You know, they suddenly become very politically aware of the BLM movement. You know, we work in high areas of deprivation and you know, community groups that come from minority groups. Um, and in London, we work with a huge you know, Afro-Caribbean community and an African community. So they, they've had all of that, you know, that suddenly took over. You know, you had the myths of 5G, you know, you had the issue around climate change. You know, suddenly young people educated about a whole load of stuff that, you know, no. Just on that one, I know, because you mentioned that like, it feels like young people are angry at the moment. And then it's just, it, to me, I probably, I probably struggle with this personally, is like just the amount of information that you're getting every day, just like thrown at you. When I was a kid, I you not think of any of this stuff politically, but in primary school especially, you might know roughly what's going on maybe, but the level of, of information and detail of information, it's constantly coming that maybe that's why they're getting a bit angry. With them. Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, young people always rebellious to society, right? I'm not, you know, they're rebellious at home with their parents, a rebellious society, and that's just young people, right? And I think what's happened in these communities, especially, is that the rebellious is like, you know, really high at the moment it's like you know i don't believe what you're saying you make no sense to me you know you're shaking hands first and then you say you can't shake hands now all those scenarios that have happened right so you've got all those kind of young people that now suddenly you know this time last year would they wash their hands for 20 seconds would they wear a mask would they you know you know this is in the space of 12 months this all has happened so for us to deliver some of our stuff, we've got to think very differently. Now, during the summer, we've done some outreach work and we met more parents in some of these communities down in North Peckham Estate, Brandon, all these estates they work in Southwark or Lambeth. They're crying out for support. They're crying out for that that need of getting my kids out to play, being at home for six months, you know, they've been in front of the screen. So coming out of it, we have a plan, you know, re-engaging, returning to play, you know, working with like, you know, Sport England and various other funders to work out how do we do it. We want to make sure that, you know, there's a supply and demand situation. You know, we don't have too many kids and we don't have, we have too many kids and we don't have enough staff. Or, you know, you have, it's all those kind of things we've got to take into account because I'm sure there's going to be a rush of kids playing football. They want to be there. So I think with all of that in mind, I think what we're trying to do is work with partners. Partners are, you know, you cannot deliver. And, you know, we have a good relationship. Our organisation wouldn't be about relationship. You know, if we don't have a relationship, we're from young people to the partners and local authority and funders. You know, you can't build nothing. So relationship is very important. And I think, you know, sport isn't the BNN, it's not the being end of our delivery. You know, we deliver a whole wide of other kind of projects and services with partners. And I think sport is one of those tools where you've got 
you can use for mass delivery, getting young people engaged. But it's the one-to-one. There's, you know, the support mechanism, the referral. So coming out of this, we've got to be prepared for that because we're going to expect suddenly, you know, young people could be really angry about society even more. You lot all liars. You're part of this. You're part of that. So it becomes, it's a norm. You know, I ask myself some of those questions. Read me then. I feel, oh God, one minute says that. Next minute says that. And I can't even answer some of the questions that the young people are asking me because the government says something else. So the inequality stuff is there. You know, definitely we're, we're, we're seeing that. The disparity is there. You know, we're experiencing it. I don't know the answers. I think we're still going to learn about that. And I think, you know, our work is crucial. What area we work in these areas, Manchester, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Belfast. If you look at all those areas, they were the highest areas of where COVID-19 happened, right? Some of these estates, some of these areas. We've been working there for years. So it shows you we're in the right places where there is a need. You know, you know, if you look at some of the issues that funders are facing, I think they're trying to move into the space of understanding more and be not just you know, reactive, be more proactive now, which is really good. I think that helps us as organisations. And violent crime hasn't stopped. It's gone through the roof. You know, during the pandemic, it hasn't stopped. So there is a problem with that, with young people and gangs. So on top of all that, COVID-19 has been a huge complicity in itself. A lot to deal with. And I think in terms of the funding, um, I know there's some funding announced recently that, I know we talk about digital poverty, but holiday hunger, hunger poverty, um, food poverty, etc. So there's the, the large amount of funding going into uh, holiday activities and, and food programme, the campaigning for Marcus Ratchford, etc. In terms of that, looking at the scale of it, it seems like organisations like yourself and your partners, you're going to have to almost like scale up overnight to be able to, to be able to support it. I mean, I'm assuming you're involved. What would you, add, the kind of advice you'd give to organisations, whether they wanted to get involved to help out and, and provide staffing or whatever it would be, the resources that are required to kind of meet the demands of that funding? Because it's, it's huge, right? Yeah, so I think there's two ways. You know, we've decided that we weren't going to hand that food past and that because we don't have that expertise. But what we did, we work with partners that were doing that food bank. So we either guided or directed families and groups and we worked in partnership and that worked really well because we didn't have we don't have the expertise and the resources to do that so that helps but i think going back to what i said you know, earlier on around relationships if you've built those relationships and you've under that and your ethos fits that, that other project organization you get a connection straight away and it works because we worked you know the voluntary sector in this pandemic done a great job not just for young people just generally the third sector done a really good job and it engaged people at a pace what government maybe couldn't have done without and civil society suddenly gone through the roof if people want to get involved with us and help an organization like us that we're looking at other stuff like you know pro bono issues around how do we grow how do you help us get the message out because we're so busy doing the work sometimes we don't have the the resources to you know showcase or tell the story and we do a good job of it but i think you know we can elevate it more we can most probably capacity build other organizations that's what we're good at doing smaller groups that sometimes are not recognized because nobody knows who they are doing more work most probably some of them bigger charity groups out there because they're at the doorstep they're, they're hidden. They've got no name. They're just a group of people. So we try to help those guys capacity build. But I think at the other end for us, we, we're looking at how do we get the structure support to make sure that, you know, we invest more time and effort into the communities. As you know, I'm sure you've seen and heard, organisations need a mechanism to work. Now, if that mechanism doesn't work, it's not going to get the end user the result it needs. So the outcome is not going to be as great. So we're finding that balance. We've gone through a change. We're in a really good position to do that we never stop taking help you know as charities we have to take the help so yeah i think if anyone's listening out there and they want to support us and help us and you know that advice you know we always love advice we don't know it all we're learning and i think if you look at the other side of it as an organization we're always here to help or talk to smaller groups that want to be a capacity building so it's a two-way we ask for help and we will help others as well sure i mean one i'm just curious on this question in terms of what you're doing and the impact you're having do you feel like you have the same impact? Obviously, you're, you're a charity. You're always having to chase funding. You always have to bring the funding in. Do you feel like almost be better if you were centrally funded? Let's say if they know, right, you're doing great work. Let's just put a budget behind it and that's going to be there. And it's always that you can just, instead of having to chase funding, you can just get on with it and, and do the work. I know it doesn't work like that, essentially, but to me, it feels like it should, right? So I don't know. Yeah, I'm just curious on your opinion on that. Yeah, I think there's education still to do to educate a lot of funders around the core cost, central cost. Nothing operates without that. And we don't get funded for core cost. No, we put, we can, no, we say we've got this management cost that we take on. But I think some organisations, again, you know, maybe of our size or maybe slightly bigger than us, you know, can operate in a way that, you know, they can make it work. But you struggle to get core costing because, you know, certain costings are not covered and you have to find means and ways or, you know, work to do that. So I think, I think funders are learning. You know, you see a lot more conversation around funders want to core fund because they get it. It's an operation that needs to work. And I think that has helped because there's one or two funders or you know, papers that have come out. And leadership, lived experience leadership is another one, which is helping. You know, 
I think there's been, an, uh, again, in 12 months, there's been loads of conversations about lived experiences and we was always lived experiences, but we never shout in the screen about it because we just did it because we was born on that estate. We're still working on that estate. And you're right, if central funding came or a portion of it came to say, we like what you're doing and they picked organisations to say, you know what, you fit that model and every three years it changed and he gave another organisation opportunity after three years. So it's fair and then it spread well. So there is models out there. But again, I think, you know, organisations like us now have come to the forefront and I think government and others have appreciated the work that we've done. You know, we filled in the gap rapidly, not just us, loads of organisations, local authorities, partners, whatever. But it shows what you can do together. You've got a relationship and you can work as a partners. That is crucial. And the people that are behind it is the most important part because sometimes you can get lost behind a person that is trying to show a organisation through one person, right? And sometimes you look at an organisation because it's one person, but you should be, there's multiple people at that ground level that are delivering, and we've got to recognise that as well. Yeah, for sure. And most definitely the pandemic's highlighted exactly the work that you're doing and or have been doing over the years. It's like come to the forefront right now. just want to switch gears a little bit and ask you about yourself personally a bit more. In terms of... What we always try and you're leading an organisation, leading a lot of partners and the senior leadership team, etc. What do you do personally to try and, uh, have you got any daily routines or anything that you do to try and stay on top form, stay with a positive mindset, etc. Is there anything that you've put in place for that? Yeah, so uh, listen, I try and go for a lot more walks now than ever before. And I think that's one part of pandemic and one, the amount of, as you just said, you know, we have to do a lot more than an average person that's doing the job, right? You know, we have to work extra hard and we have to work extra. You, know, you don't sleep at night, you wake up thinking and you go sleeping thinking. So that's the problem in our sector. Yeah, yes, yeah. so I go for lots of long walks, you know. I get myself into the gym as much as I can to keep myself away from that because it is high intensity stress in the sector because you've got to make sure you're running the organisation in a way that it represents what we set up to do and it doesn't lose its ethos. Um, we carry so much trauma. You know, we carry, we lost a lot of young people in our projects that have been stabbed or killed or, you know, through mental health, through, you know, suicide. So, you know, you carry that. You carry a staff team that sometimes can be sombre because they spoke to a group of families. So we're trying to make sure we're giving the space to our staff you know, myself especially as well, you know, trying to give ourselves, myself and you know, Jim and the leadership team, they get time out to think it through, maybe, you know, support them around it. There's a space to talk. You now, who talks to us, me and Jim, you know, we talk to each other. The joint CEOs helped us to do that. If that's a model, you know, you just don't rely on one person. There's a good conversation process happening and that support's there. Yeah, I just, it's a nice switch off, listen to music. Now, I try and follow sometimes, keep away from you no know, negative news because it's out there all the time watch less news because it's the repeat you know sky can be or BBC can be repeat yeah and I, I try and follow I've always loved culture and I always loved learning about other people so I do that and I've met a lot more people more recently during the pandemic I've had so many zoom meetings I try and keep away from them as well but yeah overall I think you know with organization and because of the love and joy of what I do I'm actually in a good place because I love my work. I love helping people. You know, I feel satisfaction of getting that, you know, social issues, supporting. That is massive. If I can go home, feel like I spoke to a kid or a young person or a family, they've understood something and it's helped them. That feels so good for me. That's something that, you know, money or charity can't buy. Yeah, getting that job satisfaction of every day, like seeing the impact Hugely. straight away. Yeah, so that's important. And seeing my staff and seeing the team and seeing, you know, the volunteers and other network partners in the community doing it, it's just rewarding. That in itself, every time you hear a good story or, or a partner or someone else like me is doing something up and down London or in the country, you're like, wow, you know what? You grew up in that area. You're doing it for your, that community. And it's not because you're getting up struggling to go to work. You're getting yourself up to do that work. That's important because that couldn't be more satisfying for, you know, people of myself you know, in these situations. And I'm not saying people would have to be in my situation, lived experience. If you, if you feel you've got that energy to help somebody, it's a great feeling. Listen, I, like many, you know, if, if you speak to other people in the charity sector, my situation, there's loads in London, Birmingham, Manchester. You know, we all try to advocate for one thing, is give a positive change in those communities that are facing inequality. For you personally, if you went back to when you were like early 20s, finishing degree, etc., could you see yourself doing what you're doing now? Back then, did you think you'd be, be leading an organisation in national, international, making this type of impact? Do you know what? I, I was always in the background. Like I was cogs in the background, just making it work. And, you know, I knew I was doing a lot of stuff and I knew I had the presence and I knew I could have it. Do you know, it's for me, I, I'm so... I like, this one thing I would never do and I won't stop doing is that I won't stop going to a session. doesn't matter how much of a joint CEO I am or wherever I go, I would always have to go to a session because and keep close to the ground work because it's important i wouldn't want to grow the organization bigger than what it is maybe you know deliver what we're good at and maybe work with partners to help them to deliver what they're good at in the community but yeah i would never take that 
away from me to go and engage in those communities because I think that again it changes the agenda changes you know we started the organization from happy slap when there was a big problem right do you remember happy slapping and yeah, the, the Nokia teardrop phone and everyone's taking pictures and to where we are now when they, when we have an incident of a kid being stabbed killed or a, a mother's grieving to suicide and you know to all the issues so, you know, county line sex exploitation we use sports and activities to challenge that how great is that you know if you can build a relationship with a young person with a game of football indirectly or in an activity you've done really well in, in your organization the outcomes sometimes you can't measure them because they're soft outcomes right which is more of a conversation and outputs sometimes it's not the result you want because outputs is easy to do you make sure the outcome is right so i think you know you know we, we as an organization you know, look at not just outcomes. We try to make sure we have other organisations also looking at outcomes similar to us. I guess that's difficult, right? Communicating that with you, with the funders or the, or the um, partners in terms of reporting outcomes, evidence in the wider impact travel. Because like you said, you can, you can do the, the outputs and of the actual programme or the session there and then, but that wider impact, is, I guess that's hard to measure. It's a typical example. If you talk to a young person on the streets, on the road or an activity, you can plant a seed in that young person's head, right? And you can have a bigger outcome because he's going to remember or he will stay with him they're saying you've played football and you enjoyed yourself there's ways of capturing that through case studies and so yeah i think you know there's there there's an education going on again around that soft outcome because you know you'll see people saying we worked with three thousand kids well how did you do three thousand kids there may be not three thousand kids or four thousand kids in that estate so i think you know showing throughput so understanding some of those terminologies and i think you know we as a sector are educating the funders. Now, I think the funders are also, because some people worked in the sector, have gone over to the fund to the other side of the line and they're understanding it. But there's a long way to go. There's a long way for me as a young ethnic minority person trying to raise awareness, you know, and to a funder. They may not listen to me. They may not want to articulate what I'm saying in their head that, oh, this is the agenda because the government's got an agenda. So I think, you know, we are collectively a group of us up and down the country have informal conversations. You know, LinkedIn has helped some of that. You know, we've got forums on LinkedIn. There's a huge number of us now in the last six months that are talking, that are building momentum, talking to bigger funders, you know, talking to the mayor's office, talking to the strategic researchers. You know, and I think that that's helping because there's a collective group of us. It's not just me saying it. <laughs> you know, there's other people in Birmingham that are saying the same thing. So you're stronger together, right? So this is what we're doing. And you need the boots on the ground, like you're saying, to make that impact, but then you need to be part of that network to, to, get, to get the funding well, that, and the major change coming down the line. And I think that impact is, again, grassroots is doing it. I think they're doing great jobs. I think some of these community groups are doing amazing jobs. Some of the smaller ones that don't have a brand name, that don't have a patron or don't have a celebrity, you know, they got, they're doing great work, but sometimes they're forgotten. And sometimes you've got to ask yourself the question is, you know, there is representation. Is it the right representation for the community? We've seen it in the football industry. It's not always the right representation. Um, you know, we're seeing it in the community industry. It is an industry. We've got to be careful. It, this has got to be a social issue, not an industry. This has got to be value for money, social value for money delivery. So I think, you know, some of the languages and representation of some of these community groups, most really so much outcomes that we can't even capture that data yet. And this is why Active Communities, the network, is part of that journey. It's the people beyond Active Communities Network that make all this work. And that's what we need to get to. It's not about, no, we're not a picture. We don't want to be the picture organisation. We don't want to be, and maybe that's our downfall. We don't tell the story properly. But we are surely getting through to local authorities, partnership work and support mechanisms that we're trying to provide for some of those smaller groups. So yeah, I think there is a lot of outcomes that sometimes need a bit of research into how you capture that. And I'm not sure how you capture all of it. I know in my head, I've spoken to that kid, I shook my hand and 10 years later said to me, you know what, Ollie, thank you for saying that to me or thank you, whoever. I've got here now because what you said then, I've never gone away through. So that, I don't know how you capture that. One last question for me, and we normally ask it, but I normally ask it to you. But in this instance, I want to say, if you had one piece of advice to give to a young person at the moment, um, and obviously parents will pass on to their young people, but what would it be if you, if you had just 30 seconds of a young person now who's maybe in those environments? What would you say? So I think what I would say, think before you do something, right? Don't do it out of moment of madness and make sure that you reflect on yourself not because of others because we live in a society where young people reflect because of others not for themselves and, and don't do it too late because when you've done the moment of madness it's too late you try to reflect then try and do it before Oli thanks so much for your time I really appreciate giving up so much of your time for us today and uh, anything you said today in terms of the links and, and contacting you we'll get it all in the show notes so people can reach out if you want to get involved Thank you James thank you Thank you for listening to this week's show you can subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts if you'd like to get in touch with us you can write to us at dryphase.podcast at coordinate.cloud, tweet us at coordinate sport, or follow us on Instagram at coordinate underscore sport, or on my account at 
James underscore Ventures. This episode was produced by Nancy Kwamboka, with support from Claire Goodchild and Lola Small, with special thanks to Rochelle. I'm James Moore, and you've been listening to The Drive Phase from Coordinate Sports.